Hi everyone, do you know about gene therapy and also the viruses that are used in gene therapy? In this video, we will be speaking to Dr. Jonas Weinmann. He is a scientist at Novartis. He explained beautifully about gene therapy and also all the viruses that are used. I really enjoyed recording this video. I hope you will love it and, and let me know what you think. Cool. So, uh, Jonas, thank you so much for joining. So, uh, Jonas, Dr. Jonas Weidman is a principal scientist at Novartis, my friend from Heidelberg. He's the expert in uh, gene therapy, especially with adeno-assisted viruses. I'm, I'm really fascinated with Jonas' work. I remember when he was telling me how he could tag or how he could inject AAVs into the animals during his research and they go into the different cell parts. So it's amazing. So Jonas, please introduce yourself to the public and then, then we talk over from there. Look at this. Uh, uh, thank you a lot for the invite. And um, yeah, as he said, um, I work a lot with viruses now. Um, my past actually it comes from a different direction. I'm officially a trained biochemist. I studied mm -hmm. in Würzburg University in Germany, like traditional biochemistry, so focusing heavily actually on the chemistry part, which I didn't like in the beginning very much. So I always uh, was fascinated about actually the biology part, and this was the main reason why I started to go into this life science. I always wanted to understand how actually the cell is working. And um, with the bio biochemical background, I was able to follow up on these streams. And during my master thesis, I actually had the first contact then um, with um, yeah, therapeutic viruses. It was not an adeno-associated virus, in short AEV. It was actually, during my master thesis, a vaccinia virus, which was used for oncolytic um, therapies. So a so-called oncolytic um, vaccinia virus. This was already very, very fascinating and um, impressive to see that a virus, which is actually considered to be something evil for mm -hmm. most of us, I guess, mm -hmm. because normally we think viruses make us sick, um, but viruses can be also used to actually treat patients for, for uh, yeah, relieving symptoms. And uh, the vaccine virus that I was using during a master thesis um, was used to treat solid tumors. And this was actually quite successfully performed, at least in mice. And my first contact um, to the fascinating world of, of viruses. Mm -hmm. I then came back to Germany. I, I did this um, master thesis in the US for one year at a small biotech company. And I came then back to Germany um, and I wanted to follow up on the, the therapeutic viruses and a very good opportunity was then offered to me in Heidelberg, um, Heidelberg University, um, where I joined the lab of Dirk Rim. <laughs> and he's focusing on adeno-associated viruses. So this was my first step into gene therapy applications. Mm -hmm. So in this case, we are now not using viruses um, to treat tumors. In this case, viruses are used as a delivery tool to bring back um, healthy genes to patients. At least that's the idea at the end of the day. I then did my PhD there for um, three years, roughly, and then um, uh, switched to the industry. I was offered a chance uh, at Beringer Ingelheim in their postdoc program, where I worked um, on the production of the AV particles, which is one of the main challenges still of this gene therapy field. And um, after two years of postdoc, I then joined Novartis last year we are now also uh, focusing on the production part of the of the AV particles. This is amazing. So you are you are one of the cutting edge researcher in, in gene therapy. Maybe maybe you know uh, there are multiple questions that I can pick. But can you explain a little bit about what exactly is gene therapy? Sure. So gene therapy is a is a new way of actually a treatment. So normally, what what people are using as a truck is normally a small molecule. So it's a small chemical compound that is used to inhibit some processes in the body. This would be option number one. Then you have another option, which would be a biotherapeutic truck. So this is an antibody where the antibody is binding to cell surfaces and also inhibiting certain pathways. And now we have a new modality since a few years, which is gene therapy. Um, and gene therapy follows another principle, actually. So it 
for the first time doesn't treat the symptoms of a disease anymore. It tries to treat the, the cause of a disease. Okay. So we have a lot of patients out there, unfortunately, that suffer from um, genetic diseases. Mm -hmm. Since birth, they have a, a genetic defect, which then um, comes out over the years and um, yeah, results in a certain disease. And mm -hmm. the ideal treatment, obviously, would be to uh, tackle the disease at its origin. And this is basically the faulty gene or mutated gene or missing gene. And with mm -hmm. gene therapy, you have now, for the first time, um, a real chance at replacing this faulty gene by a healthy gene copy. So this would mean if this works, the patient is not required to take any um, drugs to, to uh, weaken the symptoms. It, the patient would be ultimately treated for good. Oh, wow. This is like a magic gene, you know, you, you go with the problem, you, you just with the magic wand, you say like, <laughs> <laughs> it sounds, of course, very easy. It, yeah. <laughs> if, if you think about it, um, at first glance, it seems to be very easy. But if mm -hmm. you go into the details, like most mm -hmm. of the things mm -hmm. in biology, then it becomes very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. And there are still a lot of challenges mm -hmm. with gene therapy. An example, like, like, can you elaborate a bit about the challenges? Yes, there are a few, actually. Mm -hmm. So gene therapy... Um, I think is still suffering from efficiency issues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you have to imagine that um, a human body is obviously a very complex mm -hmm. cluster of cells, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you have to somehow use a delivery tool which is potent at reaching the target tissue. So let's, for instance, take um, a disease uh, like hemophilia. It's a mm -hmm. disease where a certain um, factor of blood clotting is missing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the patients and this uh, could be treated if you bring back this gene to the liver tissue okay and this is like um yeah a very well studied disease for gene therapy applications mm -hmm. um but the first hurdle is that you have to reach the liver somehow mm. and liver is actually a target which can be still reached fairly easily i would mm -hmm. say mm -hmm. um, because aavs go naturally to the liver mm -hmm. Um, but still, if you then inject um, AAV particles to mm -hmm. the bloodstream of these patients, the um, AAVs have to target the liver cells, they have to be taken up, they have to be processed in the cell, mm -hmm. until then finally um, transcription is starting of this replacement gene. And all these processes can be inhibited, of course. The cell naturally doesn't want to get infected by yeah, viruses. Okay. Mm -hmm. So there are mechanisms of the cell itself, which tries to limit viral replications. Um, mm -hmm. We have still challenges when um, the immune system um, kicks in. Okay. Obviously, viruses, as you know, um, are normally um, connected with some disease and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the immune system tries to clear the viruses. Yeah. Oh. These are like the foreign. So that means these are the three things. There is an entry barrier, like, like uh, where, where the cell has to go. Like there are multiple places if you inject in the in the blood, uh, it can go. It basically can go everywhere in the body. So now, for example, the case what you said, hemophilia, we need to target liver. So we need a targeting virus that goes to the liver. And the second one is whether the cell will uptake it or not, because there should be a process. And the third one is the immune system kicks in, and kick it off, <laughs> right? Kick the cells, uh, kick this virus off because it's foreign. It's it's invading. And yes. uh, yeah, wow, very good. So, uh, uh, so this is basically the, the definition of gene therapy. Like, what are the methods people use, uh, Jonas, in gene therapy? Well, there are a few methods out there. Um, okay. There are viral-based approaches. So this would mm -hmm. be an AV, for example, but also people use other viruses. For example, okay. adenovirus was used mm -hmm. um, a lot in the 90s. Mm -hmm. um, now it um, is used for mainly something else now, um, mm -hmm. but people still didn't forget this virus. So there are still groups working on adenoviruses for gene therapy applications. Okay. Mm -hmm. AV is, I would say, now the main focus of most of the research groups mm -hmm. in the viral space. Mm -hmm. There's also lentivirus, which you can use as mm -hmm. a gene delivery tool. And you probably heard of this already for the CAR T cell therapy. Mm -hmm. um, it's another type of virus which has its advantages over AAVs. Mm -hmm. um, and there are also non-viral based um, mm -hmm. applications where 
especially the liver can also be reached by infusions of oh, okay uh, like genetic elements uh, mm -hmm. it's still taken up then by the by the liver tissue like liposomes maybe right exactly yeah okay so liposomes i mean yeah in, in my phd i also use a little bit of aavs and lentiviruses so the, the beauty of aavs is that there are multiple types of it right the zero types maybe can you explain a little bit of what is adenovirus and then then go to adeno assisted virus yeah so um adenovirus um a lot of people mix it up with adeno associated virus mm -hmm, which mm -hmm. is a little bit dangerous because the viruses are quite different from each other mm -hmm. adenovirus is significantly bigger mm -hmm. it has a quite a huge genome of 32 kilobases mm -hmm. and av so adeno associated virus is very tiny Oh, it okay. has only roughly 4.7 kilobases of a genome. Mm -hmm. um, the thing is, they are connected to each other because AV was discovered in mm -hmm. 1965 as a contaminant of an adenoviral prep. Oh, so okay. they found when they looked at it under the microscope, they, they found little particles next mm -hmm. to the huge adeno particles. Mm -hmm. They were wondering, what is this? And mm -hmm. after analyzing, um, they noticed, oh, it's another virus. Mm -hmm. And um, that's why AV got its name, Adeno Associated Virus. Ah, okay. It okay. was discovered together with Adeno mm -hmm. Virus. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and uh, so what are the types of AAVs? Because this is where the, the beauty of it comes in, right? So, mm -hmm. yeah, like most of the viruses, it comes in different flavors. Um, mm -hmm. There are different strains out there, and mm -hmm. there's one very renowned lab, um, the lab of uh, Jim Wilson. Mm -hmm. He is trying to mine for new serotypes mm -hmm. of AV, so naturally occurring serotypes. Mm -hmm. AVs can actually be isolated from all kinds of um, organisms out there. Mm -hmm. So we have AVs from uh, from pork. We have uh, AV from humans, from apes, from cows. Uh, oh, okay. so it's, it's quite remarkable. AVs can be found almost everywhere. Okay. And the difference is that um, these viruses are having another composition of their capsid mm -hmm. and the capsid information is of course also stored in the genome. Mm -hmm. And maybe I should explain first how an AV is built up. So actually mm -hmm. the virus is very, very simple in mm -hmm. comparison to other viruses at least. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and this is the, the main reason is that the genome is very small. So the virus cannot really have functions that other viruses have. Okay. AV is tiny and has only a genome and a capsid, which makes it for molecular biologists quite interesting because we can modify it without um, yeah, changing a lot about the, the virus itself or messing up some systems that the virus uses. And AV um, is actually dependent on a helper virus. Mm -hmm. That's also the reason why it was found together with an adenovirus, because adenovirus is one of the helper viruses of AV. Uh, that's why um, AV also belongs to the uh, Dependoviridae family in the, in the virus space. So it cannot replicate without um, the co-infection of a helper virus, mm -hmm. which is very interesting because it makes it um, then a, a prime tool for gene therapy applications. So it, you have the double safety of needing a helper virus, which you don't have for gene therapy. And um, these viruses are also um, gutless. So you basically keep only a minimal sequence mm -hmm. um, that is required for the packaging of the genome. So they anyway lose already their replication, uh, replication competence. Um, and this is then the, the main reason why these viruses are so attractive because they cannot replicate by themselves okay. since don't have a helper virus you anyway remove the genetic component which would make them possible to replicate mm -hmm. uh, when there is a helper virus mm -hmm. um, AV is also very funny because it doesn't cause any disease so it's a non-pathogenic mm -hmm. virus um, at least up to date okay and it does barely integrate into the into the genome as mm -hmm. well Mm -hmm. uh, it happens. There has been now a lot of studies from the from many research labs uh, across the globe, but it's still considered to be a very, very safe virus in comparison 
to other viruses. Oh. So what happens if it, it, if it gets integrated, then it starts to express its own protein or maybe damages the internal genes, right? Yeah, AV is in this case also very special because in its natural life cycle, it integrates mm -hmm. into a very specific location. Um, okay. It's called the AVS1 locus. Mm -hmm. And it always goes into this location because um, a specific protein from AV itself tethers mm -hmm. the virus to exactly, or the, the genome of the AV to exactly this spot um, okay. on the chromosome, and then it integrates. Oh, and, and it doesn't harm the body. No, the spot is called the, the safe harbor oh, uh, because okay. it, it doesn't cause any issues uh, when an integration event is taking place. This is cool. So AVS looks like really the, you know, the, the sweet spot of gene therapy because uh, from, from you what I understood are AVS are safe and, and they need helper virus and this helper virus can be, you know, it, it could be minimum, you can make it minimum available afterwards it's not available anymore. Then, uh, then it's non-pathogenic even if it integrates, nothing happens. And, and also the, based on the serotypes. So that's what I learned from you, that you could target a specific organ in the body with the serotypes, right? So yeah, this is amazing. The, the fascinating part about AEVs, or I think also other viruses have the same ability. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, AV is so simple. Mm -hmm. And this is um, great for us because the tropism of this virus is determined by the capsid shell. So just to maybe explain the audience the word tropism, when you inject an AV into into a system, so let's let's say we inject it into a mouse, mm -hmm. um, it normally transduces then certain tissues. So basically, it goes into defined cells, and this depends um, almost exclusively on the AV capsid, which is very very interesting mm -hmm. um, because we can modify these capsids and. This is now another technology that was heavily um, followed up in the last years, especially it's the so-called AV capsid engineering, where you modify the capsid shell to basically um, change the tropism of these natural serotypes. So the natural serotypes that you fish out of different organisms, they have itself already um, themselves already different tropisms. So mm -hmm. there are most of them go to the liver if you inject them into mice, but there are there is, for example, one which goes into lung tissue, mm. another one which goes more into muscular tissue. Um, but the natural serotypes, um, they are more limited since they primarily go to the liver tissue. So what a lot of groups now um, across the globe have done is to modify the capsids mm -hmm. in a way that they can uh, discover completely novel tropism uh, patterns of these AEVs and this makes it very attractive because you might be now in a situation where you can reach a target tissue that a natural AEV would never be able to reach. Hmm. So this is genetic engineering, right? So you you, you basically hmm. modify, yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly, you, you change the genetic component which um, encodes the capsid proteins. There are mm -hmm. three capsid proteins, VP1, VP2 and VP3. Mm -hmm. that form the, the capsid shell. And if you modify this cap coding region, then you are able to modify the capsid as well. You know, the way how you are explaining, it's, it's like a beautiful science, you know, whenever, whenever students or somebody, it, it's actually like looking at Hollywood movies, you know, where, where you see Jurassic Park or something, where, <laughs> where you take the DNA out of the mosquito and then create a dinosaur out of it. So it's, it's it, I mean, the, the, I think, it really depends on what kind of teachers we get in our, you know, in, in, in our academia or in, a, in a, even our school or colleges, how much beautifully they can explain the subject. So now I, I really love the way how you explain because you are in the field and you know the, the, the beauty of the science. I really love it. I mean, uh, I wish I knew this when I was doing my PhD. I was just using AAVs and lentiviruses as the tools, but I never really tried to modify them or go in depth of them. Oh, wow. So uh, maybe, Jonas, you, know, you, you are talking more in the research side of mouse, right, or, or the mice. Uh, what about in humans? So what have been already used in gene therapy? Maybe can you elaborate a bit more on it? Yeah, AVs have been used already for human treatment. And actually, there is already um, very few drugs already on the market. Um, the most famous one is arguably the Sir Jensma drug from uh, um, 
formerly Avexis, now it's uh, belonging to Novartis. It's a gene therapy um, drug that treats SMA uh, patients. Um, and there is also... What is uh, SMA? A spinal muscular atrophy. Ah, okay. Okay, and this is one of the severe... most expensive one, right? Yes, it's a very severe disease um, yeah. where the patients have uh, limited life expectancy. So mm -hmm. they um, unfortunately die very early on. And mm -hmm. this is um, one of the yeah, very um, interesting diseases to tackle with an AED because you can intervene very early on if you discover the disease onset okay. and then hopefully change the, the outcome of this disease for yeah. the respective patient. And okay. ideally, um, you can also change this permanently. Mm -hmm. So the AV genome will stay in the body of oh. the patient. Okay. And that's that's a good news because um, this is then really the definition of a of a gene a replacement therapy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This is brilliant. I mean, I see a lot of campaigns being run, especially when the when the children are maybe two years or three years and. Uh, and they, they, if they can't afford the treatment, they run a lot of campaigns like asking for crowdfunding. And then they, they, they buy this drug and afterwards the kid is cured miraculously. And now they are, uh, you know, like normal people. There's no SMA, like spinal muscular atrophy. Uh, I mean, this is the beauty of science, right? Like, uh, I mean, put the money outside of it. But, but there's much more that can be done based on this technology. And, and what any other diseases, like any other gene therapy things that we use now? Yeah, there are now a lot of registered AV clinical trials, uh, okay. above 100, 100. that are actively, that okay. are actively running. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, they started with this already a long time ago. So over oh. 20 years ago, they started already with AEVs. They okay. were initially gene therapy, the whole gene therapy field was maybe more focused on adenovirus in mm -hmm. the very beginning. Mm -hmm. But adenovirus, um, is thought to be more immunogenic in comparison to AIDS. Oh, okay. And this is one of the key challenges of the gene therapy because you have to somehow make the immune system understand that this is now something good for you mm -hmm. and not something that you want to clear. Mm -hmm. And um, most of the um, efforts in the clinical space are now focusing on basically trying to figure out how we can better understand the interaction of the immune system and, uh, and the AV particle to make these therapies um, more efficient. Okay. I mean, this is also something very interesting when we, it's all about tools, right? What kind of toolkit we have. I, I, I remember one proverb that I used to say whenever I don't work properly uh, or when something doesn't work. For example, I have, I have a phone and I don't shoot very well with the camera. So even though it's like very good, uh, resolution everything but i don't use it then i always tell myself a bad workman blames his tools like <laughs> so if i don't know how to use it then i blame it on it but but it's not right in it it's like look look a like a adenoviruses people have used it in clinical trials but they got to know it's immunogenic now they got aavs we have crispr so the tools are evolving so the more tools evolve the more you know the treatments are are really cutting edge things comes out like like some of the problems which we thought are god given you know like like uh, chronic pain for example my phd was on chronic pain and uh, before 1600s uh, th uh, the people used to think that when when you suffer from pain it's god given you did some mistake in your life or in previous life that's why you suffer from pain now but but afterwards i think hippocrates kind of analyzed that when you touch a fire it actually goes through your nerves, it goes to spinal cord, then to brain. And this is actually, you know, a paradigm, a shift, paradigm shift. And people uh, identified some tools where you could modify it, for example, like like uh, mid deep brain stimulation, where you could reduce your pain or otherwise design some drugs for that. All whole pain therapy is basically modulating this mechanism. And there's continuous, you know, uh, rush to make new tools. So this is beautiful, like like you said, there are vaccinia virus, there are lentiviruses, there are adeno-assisted viruses, adenoviruses. I think the search will go on to until we get you know, where we take and just <laughs> put it in a mouth or or we just don't need it. <laughs> yeah, and I see this the, the evolution over the, over the last years. So I was fortunate enough to start in this field in 2015. 
<laughs> but even since two, 2015, I think the speed increased tremendously. Okay. So, as you said, uh, suddenly Neo CRISPR is also a technology which is not amongst us since a lot of years, right? Yeah. yeah. I think the first publication was 2012, if I remember correctly, like yeah. the, the first application in, in human tissues mm -hmm. uh, or human cells. So it's unbelievable how fast the wheel is spinning. And yeah. the same goes for AVs, even though we have AVs amongst us um, in the research space since over 50 years, the okay. discovery was 1960, mm -hmm. uh, 1965. Mm -hmm. But now we have, of course, different tools in our hands, also the computational power mm -hmm. that is required sometimes to make very good predictions on capsid change, for example. Mm -hmm. So we have had now in the, in the last years, very nice publications from research groups, um, especially like um, bringing out new novel capsids that okay. could be game changers. Um, for targeting different how do, tissues. How do you really predict? <laughs> so is it like tropism? Tropism is really, it depends on uh, like this lipid membrane that we have on our cells. And then you kind of do computation analysis, like which can go, it's like a magnet, like a lock and key that goes, right? Yeah, there are many possibilities how mm -hmm. to do this. Um, and the, I would say that the two major groups is the rational capsule engineering and the other one is the let's call it directed evolution approach okay so um, many groups focus now on the directed evolution approach which basically means you generate libraries of mm -hmm. millions of capsules then mm -hmm. you let them compete against each other in oh. a respective uh, screening tissue so they um, then for example that's what you did in your phd right uh, I did something similar, but not yeah. exactly this. Um, <laughs> okay. okay. But they are then um, compared in a in a mouse, for example, and mm -hmm. and at the end, the best uh, wins. So the the fittest survives. It's basically like Darwin, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, which makes it, of course, very interesting for high throughput, um, because you can screen millions at the same time. Okay. Whereas using um, the one by one approach doesn't give you so many um, possibilities. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and the, are there also any uh, trials with the CRISPR plus AAVs? CRISPR and AAV is a very attractive combination as well, yes, mm -hmm. because um, AAVs can be um, targeted to specific tissues. And with CRISPR, ideally, you want to make a cut um, specifically in the tissue that is of interest to you. Okay. Um, so the combination um, is also very interesting for the, for the field. Mm. A lot of groups um, are using AVs as a tool in comparison with CRISPR. Okay, great. So Jonas, now let's switch a bit gears to to the target audience. So my my target audience, whom I'm thinking that this podcast should be made or is being made, is the students, life science students who are making career in life sciences, like whether whether to pursue PhD, to be in academia, or or even after bachelor's or master's, just stop life sciences and go into maybe software industry because that is kind of uh, hot right now, like data sciences or, or coding and everything. So, but but my main main intention is then for them to to teach them the beauty of science. There's, there's good career as well in science, especially in, in biotechnology, even even digital health or any other digital application. Oh, <laughs> is that your cat? It's my cat. <laughs> Hello, no problem. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, what do you recommend for students uh, or even researchers, like uh, how to how to be, you know, updated with this thing and get the best out of it? So, the beauty of studying something life science related is that you have so many possibilities. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, um, yes, I'm now still in science and mm -hmm. I'm happy about this, mm -hmm. but there are so many other possibilities with a life science um, study. So mm -hmm. you can go to um, quality control, you can go to sales, you can go to teaching. Uh, you know, there are really a lot of possibilities out there. What I would recommend is to be very open-minded already mm -hmm. during the studies. I mean, book the different courses. The university is here really a very good platform to learn many different things, not only about biology, but I mean, you can learn um, something about manufacturing, for example, or languages, also very important. Um, if you have the chance, feel free to um, apply for maybe a 
an internship at a company mm -hmm. it's also a completely different um work life you know it's maybe more controlled um daily work uh and this gives you then mm. the power to to decide at the end of the day what do i actually want to do okay because it's very difficult for a young person when i remember now when i was 18 or 19 i decided to study biochemistry but did i really know what biochemistry was all about yeah oh, of course not. <laughs> but right. but now but now when you when you talk to younger self of jonas uh like let, let's say bachelor student what would you recommend especially in the field of gene therapy would you would you recommend him to take a pursue career in this field absolutely i think okay. it's it's super fascinating um every day i go to work i'm i'm motivated i'm happy i, mm -hmm. I love what i'm doing mm -hmm. i think um the fascinating part is that it's not as standardized as maybe other fields mm -hmm. out there mm -hmm. so there's still a lot to discover mm -hmm. which is awesome for curious persons mm -hmm. and um it's now for the first time also a field where you can really tackle the disease by its roots mm -hmm. so you can really change this forever you can make um, a diseased person uh, to a healthy person mm. and, and this is fascinating this is really unbelievable and yeah. we are here at the very beginning so yes oh. you can argue hey we know this virus since 50 years already uh, which is true mm -hmm. but the tools that we um, acquired now over the last decade maybe i think uh, put us all into a prime position to further develop these therapies mm. and make them more refined um, which at the end of the day is um, is benefiting the patients tremendously Yeah. And for for the yeah. young students, I mean, if gene therapy is really something that is of interest, um, then, I mean, look for possibilities to do a, a practical course or something like this or an internship in groups where gene therapy is uh, researched on. Um, there, when I was studying, there was not so much in the studies about gene therapy, if at all, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. It was more focused on, you know, like classical biology, chemistry, and so on. This could have changed. I, I don't know. I'm not studying anymore. <laughs> um, but my advice is to, yeah, to be open-minded. Um, do some internships. Okay. Don't mind so much about the wasted time. So, you know, I heard this already a lot that, yeah, but it's half a year. Or they want to have me for half a year. Um, I don't know if I want to do this because then I, my bachelor will be delayed by half a year. Mm. My advice is don't care. Okay. Half a year, it's great. Um, it's a very good opportunity to learn something new. Mm -hmm. And if your bachelor took half a year longer or one year longer, it, do it doesn't matter really. Mm. What matters more is that you gained more experience. You are way more open-minded. Um, you know, you saw different facets of science and mm. uh, they are beautiful and uh, cool. be open to them. This is, this is my advice. Yeah, this is great. This is great. I also recommend students to take internships as much as possible because the internship is an experience, especially if you work with an industry, maybe you will, you will understand how industry is thinking. And also it may be the next step for you to get a job, you know, it, it, exactly. that's the other, um, part of an internship um, mm -hmm. you get to know the people mm -hmm. um, it's very important for the personal development mm -hmm. that you learn how to work in a team mm -hmm. because at the end of the day um, science is a team effort you know mm -hmm. you, you cannot achieve anything alone or you can but it takes you very long time uh, and you can have the same results if you if you work in a team and you rely and trust on other people as well and their mm -hmm. expertise Mm. And having uh, an internship is, I think, the, the perfect opportunity to also learn to play a role in a team, okay. how to contribute to a team, mm. how to trust other people. Um, and yeah, and I think this is what it's all about. Mm. Jonas, maybe uh, another question following up on now, not the students, now more about startups and innovation. So do you see that uh, new startups are already working on gene therapy? Because uh, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Absolutely, there is um, a lot going on. 
okay. in the startup business, I would say, with gene therapy. And mm -hmm. uh, I don't see this to stop at some point. Okay. I think gene therapy got very, very interested for um, industry lately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is probably a big reason is that the first gene therapy drug um, developed by Unicure mm -hmm. was called Glybera came mm -hmm. um, on the market 2012 in Europe. And okay. this was, um, I think, a huge boost for the field because suddenly industry was realizing, oh, you can make this or bring this to the market, right? Mm -hmm. And um, then also bigger companies are now heavily investing into gene therapy applications mm -hmm. as a new modality. Uh, and even the, the very big players are now putting money into this. But mm -hmm. of course, this also strengthens the whole field. So there will be small biotechs who offer a very specific service, you mm -hmm. know, uh, like an expertise they acquired over the years, um, and then um, can work with the with the bigger players. I see here a lot of movement uh, in the U.S. where mm -hmm. we have fascinating um, small biotechs that are working on the different facets of AV. There is a lot of activity in capsid engineering. Mm -hmm in small biotechs uh, and i think it's a it's also now thinking about the students again a mm -hmm. huge opportunity so if you have a possibility to do an internship in one of these small biotechs mm -hmm. definitely recommend it go ahead uh, you will learn a lot because it's not only the 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 field that will be then one of your experiences afterwards it's also working then in a small very dynamic biotech company mm different than a, than a bigger player. I, I mean, I, I also like the way that you, you said that uh, big, big biotech companies are investing in these small biotechs. Mm -hmm. So that means that the whole investment landscape, whole, whole I would say, uh, an ecosystem is getting evolved around that, right? Like uh, even the governments will be supporting it and also this big business around it. Maybe with the, with the COVID vaccine, we have seen a couple of vaccines are, I think, I didn't know assisted virus vaccines, right? They, they made COVID plus adeno-assisted virus as full vaccine. Yeah, for the vaccines, there are like now the, the SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. There are mm -hmm. um, different approaches as well. I mean, we have the very famous mRNA vaccines, which is mm -hmm. a technology that is now used um, for the first time mm -hmm. uh, as a vaccination tool. But there is also um, the viral-based approaches, um, mm -hmm. which and they use adenovirus for this. So here. Mm -hmm. Uh, you use the very good abilities of an adenovirus because it's, mm -hmm. um, you know, quite immunogenic. So it's perfect for vaccination since oh, you okay. really um, can boost the immune system. Mm -hmm. And there are now also activities, I saw it in the, uh, on, on a conference or in literature that people want to develop um, a COVID vaccine with AAVs. Okay. So it's, it's basically... Um, also possible if you can mm. use an adenovirus um, i guess you could also use an AV. this is surprising or actually very interesting so in gene therapy we don't want to use adenovirus because it's immunogenic but in vaccine we need to use or we can use adenovirus because it's immunogenic yeah the, the, the dose is something completely different um this is what people should not mix up um yeah uh, it could be dose but the thing is just the thinking pattern you know yes just the thinking pattern it's the same property but for different purpose and it is useful actually right <laughs> yes i mean the the protein that you are expressing is back protein is also quite immunogenic um, mm -hmm. and you just rely on the fact that your immune system will recognize this mm -hmm. and then build an immunity how you achieve this is at the end of the day uh, irrelevant it's just mm -hmm. important that your immune system um, gets um, the information uh, against what it should build uh, yeah antibodies great great you know so i think now we are we are kind of end of the podcast i it, it's amazing like i i'm getting more fascinated about science even though i come out it came out from the science but but i, I still at the core of my heart i am still a biologist <laughs> a life scientist are there yeah, any you will never lose this it's <laughs> like riding a bicycle yeah exactly right <laughs> are there any final words that you want to talk about the field like where it is going and where you see yourself being a thought leader, maybe at one point, once you, you know, like get 20, 30 years of experience in the field, I think you are a thought leader. You are the key opinion leader in this field. So maybe a final words you could, you could share with me. 
I'm looking very positively into the future. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I'm super curious to see where we are in 10 years. Okay. I think it's incredibly motivating to see that so many of the of the big players are now investing into this technology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, as a scientist, you realize it maybe earlier because you've worked on it since mm -hmm. many years, but it doesn't mean anything because at the end of the day, what we want to achieve is we want to treat patients mm. and treating patients is complicated. It involves a lot of um, refinement, uh, manufacturing and so on. And I see now for the first time that there is enough motivation and the willpower to also make this um, suitable as a, as a truck on the market. And it, I think it will be tremendous to see what we achieve now in uh, like, let's say 10 years time or so. Yeah. So um, super uh, <laughs> happy to see Great. where this journey is going. Great. I remember, I remember in, um, in, in DKFZ uh, in 2013, I think there was this guy, Siddharth Mukherjee, who wrote, who wrote a book about cancer, you know, Emperor of Maldives. Mm -hmm. he, he said that uh, how many PhD students who are doing cancer PhD? PhD in cancer, but how many have you really seen a cancer tissue or a cancer patient? I think there were none. Only few of the medical doctors raised their hand. Remaining all of them, they were doing laboratory research, but they were never really understanding how it goes to the patient. But this is what fascinates now with your work, at least like there's a complete circle, right? That's why I'm saying stay open-minded. You know, yeah. get informed what this actually means, what you're doing every day. Mm, mm. So when I have an intern, I what I always tell them is, before we touch any pipe, we mm -hmm. first think about why we are actually doing, doing this. Okay. Because this is the most important also to stay motivated. If you just do something um, and you, you don't really care, you don't feel attached to it, mm -hmm. you will lose motivation and it will make you unhappy. So mm -hmm. it's very important to find something which motivates you, mm -hmm. which you would like to push with all the power you can offer. Yeah. And I think it, it was a very good example that you made. Um, it's important to understand why we are doing gene mm. therapy right mm. Mm. it's not only about uh, having good publication at the end of the day True. it might be good to find a professorship at some point but at the end of the day we are doing this to to treat people yeah uh, we shouldn't forget about this yeah very well jonas thank you so much thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and uh, we'll stay in touch so whenever there is something new please share with us <laughs> absolutely thanks a lot <laughs> sure jonas Bye then. Bye bye. Hi everyone. I hope you enjoyed the video and learned a lot about gene therapy. If there are any questions or comments, please do not hesitate to reach out to me. Thanks. Bye bye.